This is Dead Serious, a show about short horror stories worthy of discussion. I'm Dead Palette, star of Season 3 of Making an Arsonist. Today we're going to be taking a look at a story entitled Burn by C.K. Walker. I've looked at C.K. Walker's work before. Some of it I've been a fan of. Some of it I really haven't been a fan of. But regardless, I'm always interested in her work. And, you know, this is a great uh, excuse to look into more of what she has made. Um, this story was published uh, April 12th, 2016, so a more recent work. And this story was recommended by one of my patrons, uh, Benjamin Dresden, I believe is how that name is pronounced. Anyway, let's get into this. Uh, I'm interested to see what uh, kind of interpretation they have around a story about fire. Hi, Brian. That's how our story starts. I know I should come to see you more often, but I never remember the visiting hours for this place. Sigh. It's no excuse, I know. I guess if I was honest, I'd admit that this place depresses me. I'm sorry. That's a rude thing to say. All right, so we are Brian, and we are being spoken to. All right, not not much else to say there, but um, this place is depressing. We're getting that. Let's let's press on. Well, anyway, my year was great. My son had his second child, my fourth granddaughter. Her name is Emma. I've been pretty lonely since Lily left me, so I got my uh, got a dog in May. I named him BJ after you, Brian. He likes to go with me on walks around the lake. Let's see, what else? Okay, so this paragraph, we're finding out that uh, we are older. Maybe that um, Brian was committed to some sort of psychi- psychiatric or, um, you know, even a old folks home or something like that. Because uh, our narrator is uh, old enough to have a, grand- a granddaughter, a fourth granddaughter even. And uh, the, their children aren't around, so they're lonely. So they got a dog named BJ. All right. All of this working so far. Very uh, telling instead of showing, but I guess that that would make sense if this is supposed to be conversational. So let's press on. My daughter got me cable, and I spend a good solid five days watching TV. You won't believe what kind of shows they have now. I think a whole new genre is invented every year. It's a whole... It's a wonder... I leave the house, but I do leave because, well, I have some news. I met a woman over the summer. Her name is Holly. I asked her to marry me last month, and wouldn't you know it, she said yes. I know what you're going to say. That's too fast. But I think I love her, and at my age, there's no time to waste. Anyway, she is the reason I wanted to see you this year. Okay, so we only visit Brian uh, once a year, and we are getting married. All right. I knew it was only a matter of time before she asked about the burns, and shortly after I proposed to her, she did. I never told Lily the truth, but I think I'm going to give honesty a try this go-around. But before I tell her what really happened all those years ago, I think I owe it to uh, you to tell you the truth of the incident first. After all... You were there. I don't know how much you remember, so I'll start at the beginning. All right, so it seems as though um, Brian is fading in faculties if they're not remembering this kind of stuff. Um, that's kind of the, the the message I'm getting, especially seeing as Brian isn't responding. We're just talking at Brian. And along with that, we're also finding out that our narrator has burns, and they didn't tell their deceased wife what the true origins of these burns were. Do you remember how we met? My mother, a scandalous single woman in the 50s, was living with her mother in Chris River when I was born. That's where I met you, remember? You were trying to catch fish with a stick and one of your mother's uh, earrings. I helped you dig for worms. We never caught anything, but we quickly became the best of friends. We were together every day, school or summer, Adam and Brian, always up to mischief. Our parents became friends. I loved living out in Chris River, all that farmland, all the wildlife. But then my mother met Richard, and we moved far away to the city. I guess looking back, it wasn't that far, but as a kid I remember feeling like it was the other side of the planet. So we have older folks waxing nostalgic about past times. Um, We're getting these cute bits about 
uh, going fishing with uh, the mother's earring. We know that our narrator is named Adam now. Uh, this uh, this story is got some smaller paragraphs that kind of keep the the story's momentum going. Um, it's got an interesting pacing, but I think it's keeping a brisk pace. I miss you a lot. I missed you a lot at first, but I soon made friends and I'm so sorry to admit this, Brian. I started for to um, I started to forget about you a little bit. Things were getting better for me until my mother sat me down one day to tell me about your realness. I did pity you, Brian. When she offered to take me trick-or-treating in Chris River a few days later for Halloween, I jumped at the chance. Brian and Adam together again. Okay, so this is, uh, you know, Brian apparently had some sort of illness even earlier on in life. This isn't something that was on set uh, later in life. She tried to warn me about your condition, but it didn't prepare me to see you like that. You were asleep when I walked into your room, and when I tried to wake you, your mother stopped me. I remember being shocked when she told me that you weren't allowed to trick or treat. I was so angry because no one told me I would be going alone. I had worked so hard on my vampire costume, and now you wouldn't get to see it. And then my mother told me she wasn't going to drive me to the suburbs. I would be stuck going farmhouse to farmhouse, collecting small handfuls of candy every other mile. All right, that that would be frustrating. Um, You know, I think children don't deal with disappointment very well. And the idea that not only do you not get to see your friend, um, you're going to be, you're missing golden opportunities with your candies. Remember, kids uh, always go, either go to the rich neighborhoods or go to the neighborhoods where the houses are closer together. Uh, you're going to get the nicer candy at the upscale neighborhoods, but you're going to get a greater quantity of candy if the houses are closer together. So you got to weigh your options. I would say go to one neighborhood earlier in the night and then switch it up. That's the proper technique. That way you get a full, uh, you know, full candy bars here and there, but then you also get uh, greater quantities of candy. You know, diversify your options is what I'm saying. As I left, I promised you that I would give you half my candy. I would trick-or-treat harder than I'd ever trick-or-treated before. All right, that's a, that's a nice note. Uh, my mother gave me a pillowcase and told me to be back by 8 p.m. She then released me into the wilds as the sun sunk into the horizon. Mom stayed in Nana's kitchen to chat, and they both waved at me out the window as I set off down the dirt driveway. This was back, apparently, when, um, uh, you know, you didn't have to have your parents chaperone you everywhere. Uh, boy, have how times have changed. First, I went to the MacArthur, uh, to MacArthur's, the Jacksons, and the Wittons. Those three houses took me over an hour, and in the end, I was frustrated to look in my bag and see that I had, uh, had all I had to show for it was a handful of Tootsie Rolls and Dum Dums. Ugh. Not enough to share. Not at our age. All right. Uh, that's, again, nice. We, we, the, these are people that we know, apparently, you know, the MacArthur's, the Jackson's, the Wittons, uh, and the fact that that ta- took, uh, over an hour, that, that's, you know, that's a bad hit ratio on candy. I went to the Na, Na, Nan Felts and the McBrides. I started towards the Tin Fords, but I saw their porch light was off, so I turned around before I had gotten too far down the road. I checked my Bugs Bunny watch, and bit back tears when I saw I only had enough time for one more house. I looked down into my pillowcase to take inventory and, uh, again, and said my first real swear word ever. Still not enough to share. I knew uh, this next decision was crucial. After thinking about it for a few precious minutes, I decided that my last house would be the Young's. I remembered that they were fairly well off and had a new baby, so they were sure to be home and giving out candy. All right, so I like the logic and the thought processes of our narrator. I'm getting an idea of who they were when they were a child, and the things that they're reminiscing on also tell us about who they are as an adult as well, as an older adult even, uh, in, in their twilight years. I walked down Wadditch Road for half a mile until I saw their giant, white house. I could see decorations in their yard and their porch lights blaring brightly to welcome hungry trick-or-treaters. I knew I had made the right decision. I covered the rest of that half mile in record time, passing by only one other trick-or-treating family on the way, their bags heavy and their mouths smeared with chocolate. 
I hoped they had found their fortunes at the young house. I ran the rest of the way and took the porch steps two at a time. So this is setting up a kind of contrast for us. We've seen that they are, that, that our narrator, Adam, is bereft of any candy in this situation, like just doesn't have enough candy, but this family is walking away with a ton of candy and chocolate on their face, which is telling us that uh, they've hit an oasis of candy, if you will. I rang the doorbell and hopped from foot to foot, hardly containing my excitement. I heard footsteps inside and waited for the door to open. Ten seconds. Fifteen seconds. Twenty but no one opened the door. I rung the bell again, and this time saw someone peek out from the living room in me. I waved at them and smiled because this time I knew they had seen me. Another thirty seconds went by, and my fa- uh, smile began to falter. I knocked on the door but heard and saw nothing more from within the house. And then the porch light went out. The porch lights went out. I remember standing in shock for several long minutes. They had given the rest of their candy to the family I had passed. Had they given their mm, had they given their uh, the rest of their candy to the family I had passed on Wattage? Did they truly have nothing left for me? I was crestfallen. I didn't have the time to go to another house. You're not supposed to have your porch lights on if you're not giving out candy. Everybody knows that. I became irrational and angry, and in my frenzied state, I did something that has haunted me these last sixty years. This was the incident. Okay, so as things do when you're a child, that that is a crushing disappointment. I would be pissed as well, and I'm going to guess, you know, this is just an assumption based on the information we have so far, that our narrator is going to burn this house down. Now, that might seem like an overreaction, and maybe in hindsight it is, but come on, I think our, our narrator is justified here in a little bit of arson, um, especially when you're not getting your proper candy. Uh, Alright, I picked up one of the Young's jack-o'-lanterns and flung it as far as I could into the cornfield. Mm. Alright, that's where our fire is going to come from. Uh, apparently it wasn't intentional. With my weak little eight-year-old arms, I didn't get very far and saw it smash into the ground, a mess of orange pulp and seeds as the tea light rolled out into the densely covered floor of dry corn husks and leaves. This is all um pretty visual, even though it's kind of being described in plain language. We get a vivid picture of a clear white farmhouse uh with that that's really big with a giant cornfield, very autumn colors, um, you know, the bright lights coming from the house, those being shut off, um the the orange pulp and everything. Um when you use color like that, it kind of punctuates stuff and, and that's very helpful to leave a visual marker in your mind, I think. Um, you can comp- you can accomplish that with very plain language, just a few colors, few descriptors. You don't need a whole lot. And uh, this story is doing uh, more with less, if that makes any sense. It all went wrong so fast. I ran into the cornfield and tried to put the small fire out with my cape. I succeeded but burned my way, uh, wrist badly. Then suddenly, the dying embers ignited a nearby pile of dried leaves and began to creep into the corn stalks. I am ashamed to say I panicked and I ran. I remember grabbing my candy off the porch as I ran. I fled from the young's house, nursing my raw red wrist and crying from the stinging pain of the burn. I took back several, I looked back several times to see if there were, uh, there was any smoke but it was difficult to tell in the quickly darkening night sky. And the further away I got, the more and better I became convinced myself I'd overreacted. The fire had been so small. Surely Mr. Young had already noticed and extinguished it. If it still burned, I would hear fire trucks, wouldn't I? The air would be warmer, wouldn't it? But the night was quiet and cold. Again, I love that we're getting the thought process of our narrator. Um, the regret, the justifications, the back and forth in, in the narrator's mind, all in this paragraph is very vivid. Um, and then the punctuating at the end of, but the night was quiet and cold. That's very nice. I'm, I'm on board with this story. I did not share my candy with you that night. When I reached Nana's house, I began, I, I begged my mother to leave. 
I said I didn't feel good and that I thought I might have caught your illness. She felt my forehead and then kissed my grandmother goodbye as I pulled her out to her old blue Datsun. I cried loudly and theatrically as we drove away, hoping to impress upon my mother our desperate need to get a home. As she sped down Stay Road and onto the highway, I chanced one look out of the rear view, uh, at, out of the rear window. All right, so we're getting the guilt here and the the hesitation, not the hesitation, the um, the the frantic. You know, we need to get out of here because they don't want to be at the scene of the crime. That's um very real. I think that a lot of people can relate to memories of trying to avoid getting caught doing something they're not supposed to when they're young. Um, you know, this this uh is is very vivid. Th- those emotions. I haven't had, <laughs> I haven't had those guilt ridden emotions in a long time, and it's funny uh uh having memories along those lines. All along the horizon, just above the trees. The darkness of the night sky had taken an almost imperceptible orange hue. I knew what it was, and I was frightened. Just as I began to doubt myself, I thought I saw a single flame lick up into the sky and disappear as quickly as it had come, leaving behind a sick, sinking feeling in my stomach. I fell back down into my seat and curled into a ball, moaning as hot tears stole down my face. Stole down my face? Shouldn't it be rolled down my face? Stole down my face? Hmm. Um, but this paragraph, again, just really driving home the guilt, the sinking feeling that you're going to get caught, all of that stuff working very vividly. Um, my mother was so worried she took me straight to the hospital. Richard met us there, and he too became concerned at my panic hysterical state. I was shaking and crying uncontrollably, unable to utter even one comprehensible word. The doctor was so concerned about my hysteria that he kept me overnight for observation. It was when I awoke in the morning that I first heard about the extent of the blaze. My mother and Richard were sleeping in the uncomfortable chairs by my cold white bed, and I could hear the nurses speaking right outside my door. All right, again, just furthering the 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 inescapable fact that this has happened and that you might get caught for it. I'm loving this. The following is a series of dialogue going back and forth. It was so awful. We were ready to take on the rescued victims, but there were so few. Yes, such a shame. What is the number at now? 18 dead, and there's still quite a few missing. How awful. Just dreadful, and the firemen are still fighting it, uh, fighting to get control of it. It's spread out of Chris River. It's been such a dry season. Do they know how it started? I haven't heard. Do you know they, that, mm, they know where it started? Such a young family? Hmm. Okay. Did they, did all of them perish? Yes, and so many more. Oh, stop, Robin. I think I might cry. Okay. Wow. So we have an 18 body count and there are still people missing uh, from this child's overreaction and throwing this pumpkin. Um, this is, this is how this stuff always starts. It's, it's always just one thing and then it snowballs and they're, they're, yes, I'm loving this. It's a very realistic thing. Um, you know, feeling guilt ridden. Apparently our narrator got away with it because no one found out. Um, but, and they didn't even tell their, their deceased wife. Um, but, you know, that's, woof, woof, that's a lot of guilt to take to the grave. So they're getting it off their chest. I buried my head back under the covers and cried to myself. Soon my mother would take, would wake up and she would hear what I had, ha- what had happened in Chris River. Was Nana all right? Were you? Mother would know I had done it. She had always seen, she had seen the burns on my wrist. She know, I'd know she'd had. I had to uh, let the doctor see, but my mother had. I hadn't let the doctor see, but my mother had. Okay. At some point, I fell asleep again, and I was shaken awake by Richard, who bore a solemn expression. Mother was gone, and he wouldn't tell me where. She just he uh, just shook his head sadly. He called the doctor to check on me, and she looked me over, then discharged me. On the way home, Richard told me that there had been a fire in Chris River and my illness, whatever it had been, may have saved me and my mother's life. 
he hugged me then. Okay, it seems as though our grandmother, uh, the, the grandmother of Adam, has passed away due to fire caused by Adam. Mother was sitting at the kitchen table when we arrived home. I, uh, she felt my forehead, spoke quietly with Richard, and then sat me down at the table and quietly told me that my grandmother had been taken by the quick, spreading, lethal wildfire that had consumed Chris River overnight. I asked about you. I think I loved you more than my grandmother. All right. This is, uh, you know, a lot of gravity to put on a child. Uh, you know, th that's something that they're not going to be able to deal with. How can you, how can a, a child who isn't emotionally developed deal with the fact that they, their, you know, accident has caused so much death and the fact that, um, maybe they could have prevented it had they gone inside and told, uh, the young family to deal with the fire. I remember waiting for them to come and take me away from my mother. I was so afraid of jail. But no one ever came. Adults whispered that a teenager in a witch costume was to blame for the fire. A witness had seen someone running from the young house around eight o'clock. But it wasn't a witch. Uh, but it wasn't a witch. But it wasn't a witch. I was a vampire without a cape. As you can guess, they never found the witch. My mother stopped mentioning my grandmother around me, and my wrist healed poorly. I never forgave myself, though. I did try not. Um, to, uh, I tried to forget about the Chris River fire and my part in it. Your part in it? <laughs> you, were, you were entirely responsible for it. Okay. Um, I do have the question of how the mother didn't put two and two together about the burns on the wrists. That, that's weird. Um, but maybe the mother was being willfully ignorant or neglectful or is an idiot. I don't know. But that is a, a nagging problem that's been bothering me about this. I, I, I'm hoping that there's some sort of explanation given, but um, you know, if if not, then then I guess that's how it needs to be. But that seems like a weird. Uh, it seems like a weird, illogical thing that a mother wouldn't be able to pick up on that, uh, or pick up on a child's you know guilt. Um, actually, not so much. I, I've I've seen kids hide their guilt behind uh, being sick. Ew, excuse me. You see, Brian, it was me that killed 22 people that night. It feels good to tell you after so many years. Thank you for being patient. Six decades is a long time to wait to t for the truth. Mother has been dead for 15 years, as you know. She took my secret to her grave. I've also brought this for you. The candy I promised you that night in 1963. These Skittles will have to do uh, as I have long since lost the candy from that Halloween. I'm sorry you can't eat them, but I hope you will accept my gesture. I've also, of course, brought you this jack-o'-lantern, as I have done every year I've visited. I hope you don't find it in poor taste now, but it's our tradition and I couldn't bring myself to break it. I couldn't find a battery-operated tea light uh, this year, so I'm lighting a real candle. I would be wary of all of this grass. But luckily, it rained this morning, and it won't burn for long. So, is our narrator going to burn down wherever Brian is? Sigh. Damn it, Brian. I wish things had been different. I wish you hadn't had the chicken pox that Halloween. I wish I hadn't gone to the young house. I wish I had got to see you every year on your birthday instead of the anniversary of your death. Oh, okay. So that's why they're... Oh, ha-ha! <laughs> Okay, that's why they're dead. All right. Um, that makes a lot more sense now that we got a dead, uh, person we're talking to. We're at a grave. That makes a lot more sense. Uh, and that's, that's a nice little twist. I'm sorry. I have to go now. I'm going to light, uh, I'm going to a candle lit Virgil with Holly in Chris River for the victims of the fire. Her father died fighting it, sadly. I go almost every year after I visit you. I hope that you can forgive me some day. Now that I've told you the truth, I probably won't visit any more. I'm so sorry, Brian. I loved you like a brother. I hope to see you again some day, if you'll have me, wherever you are, Brian. Happy Halloween. This is Halloween. This is Halloween. Uh, okay, so I have a I have an interesting question. C.K. Walker is popular on uh, No Sleep. And No Sleep is known for deleting stories that, you know, aren't horror. And I wonder if this story would stick up 
Um, because C.K. Walker is popular there, so maybe there is that kind of um, favoritism towards her. But there is also the possibility that um, their story would be uh, deleted because it's not horrific enough. It's, you know, it's not, there. there's not a skeleton that pops out at the end. There's not a haunting. There's not, you know, a xenomorph that comes down and then, uh, the, the xenomorph is decapitated and then the xenomorph is a headless horseman xenomorph. You know, that's, that, this isn't that kind of story. This is my kind of horror story. This is the kind of story that I like where, the horror is the guilt, and that guilt is a very real life thing, and that's something that I like talking about because people want to avoid that. There's a real lesson to be had in a story like this, and that um that guilt is a real life thing, and I think it's a lot more relatable because of that because it's not dealing with some sort of extraterrestrial monster because it's not dealing with you know giant spider people from nars it's it's very down to earth and it's something that not not on the same scale hopefully hopefully people aren't hiding a bunch of people that they are that they manslaughtered you know but uh i think a lot of people are hiding some sort of guilt uh and to have a story that tackles this uh, in such a way um you know dealing holding on to something for uh, six decades you know over twice as long as I've been walking this earth, holding guilt that long is something uh, insane. And how do you come to terms with that? And what do you do when when you marry someone? Do you tell someone about that? You know, they, they lied. I like the twist about the chicken pox because it was just chicken pox. So that's a serious thing. Um, but we're, you know, we're led to believe that our narrator is, you know, still in some sort of hospital, uh, and that they are unresponsive, uh, that they might be in a vegetative state, something along those lines. And then we're given that twist. Uh, that's lovely. This is, um, put under the category of uncategorized. And I think that that's why these kinds of stories, um, don't thrive as often, uh, is because, you know, you can't put this in a, in a, a straight category. We've taken to using the term Ashcan whore, and I, I think that that term applies here. But how do you, um, promote a story like this when, uh, the title is something ambiguous like burn? There, there's a lot to say about this story, and I think that there's a lot to love about this story. I wish that there was some sort of even half-assed explanation given, uh, to why the mother didn't look into the burns, um, whether the explanation is the mother's stupid or naive or willfully ignorant or the narrator just doesn't know and kind of posits multiple theories to that. But as it is right now, that part is a little lacking. But uh, truly, I had a great time reading this story. Uh, thank you for the recommendation, uh, Benjamin. This this was a really fun read. Um, I did enjoy this story quite a bit. Um, there were a lot of details about it that were just, you know, great on point. Wasn't overly verbose. Uh, good, good read. Now, if you enjoyed that, consider checking out the Fear Fiction Podcast where three assholes, Talking Basement Goose Slime Beast, Inebriated Interstellar Traveler Abysme, and myself read all stories horror and internet related, paragraph by paragraph, and bullshit while we do it. From adolescent revenge fantasies to subtle, postmodern narratives about real life events and everything in between, we read them and we critique them. Link to that is down in the description. Thank you so much much for your time and now on to our sponsor at this non moment in time which is Dotson Automotive Brand Dotson Automotive Brand relaunched in 2013 despite no one fucking asking for that